This lesson is for FST 4.2 on trigonometric or circular functions. Whenever the word trigonometric or trigonometry is mentioned, students should know that that's referring to sine, cosine, and tangent. Here those things are listed out in their full format. Typically though when we write them, we write them as just three letters as abbreviations. Please keep in mind, students, that you don't say sin or cos here. You should still say sine and cosine when you see these abbreviations. A quick review of SOCATOA, which is an acronym that students should have learned when they first learned about right triangles and when they first learned about sine, cosine, and tangent. Sine, cosine, and tangent are all used typically when we're working with a right triangle. In a right triangle, the longest side of the triangle is pointed to by the 90 degree angle and it's called the hypotenuse. The other sides of the right triangle are called the legs. And when you're working with sine, cosine, or tangent you have to have an angle that you're also working with as well. Let's assume that the angle that we're working with is this angle down here. Remember that this symbol is referred to as a Greek symbol called theta. That's its name, just like pi is the pi symbol. So this is the symbol we typically use for angle measure. So if I'm looking at the S of the SOCATOA acronym, the S stands for sine. You always do sine of an angle. And then the O over the H represents the opposite over the hypotenuse. Opposite refers to the opposite leg. So when you're looking at this angle, the opposite leg to that is the one on, in this triangle would be this leg here. So we would need this length and this length and we would divide those out and we'd be able to find the sine of the angle. If you're doing the cosine of the angle, we'll keep the angle the same. Now we would do A over H. A stands for adjacent, which would be the leg that is right next to the angle itself. So that is adjacent over hypotenuse. The tangent is of an angle as well, so we'll keep the angle the same. We would do the opposite over the adjacent. So if you're working with tangent, you would not be utilizing the hypotenuse side of the triangle at all. Keep in mind that if you did change the angle to be this angle up here, now the opposite and the adjacent labels here would switch. So now this would be the opposite leg and this would be the adjacent leg. So know that it all depends upon which angle you're working with in order for you to decide which of these they are. We're going to take that idea now and we're going to superimpose it onto quadrant one of our unit circle. So focus in on just quadrant one. Keep in mind that when we're on the unit circle, we always start over here at the point one zero. We're going to rotate that point counterclockwise to move it in a positive fashion. And as I maneuver around the circle, I'm going to find all these other coordinates. I want to find any coordinate on the circle though, and I'm going to use trigonometry to do it. Keep in mind that on the unit circle, the reason why it's called the unit circle is because the radius is one unit of length. So that would represent, in this picture, it would represent the hypotenuse of the triangle. To get to this location, which I'm just going to call location B, to actually find where that coordinate is on the edge of the circle, I would need a horizontal amount and I would need a vertical amount. Because we all know that every coordinate comes from an X and a Y. So the X would be the horizontal distance to get to the point, the point and the Y would be the vertical distance to get to that point. Because what's formed here is a triangle, I'm going to utilize SOCATOA to help me come up with other values for x and for y. Let's start with the cosine. If I'm using this angle here to generate the angle that gets me from A to B, I would say that the cosine of that angle is the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. The adjacent side is the x side and the hypotenuse is the length of 1 x divided by 1 is simply x. So if I'm trying to find the x part of the coordinate for where I am on the circle, I would simply need to do cosine of the angle that it took me to get there. If I do the sine of the angle back in this triangle here, the sine would be the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. So that would be y over 1, which we know is simply y. So if I'm trying to find the y value of a coordinate on the unit circle, I would do the sine of the angle that got me there. 
So whenever you're working with a coordinate on the unit circle, you can simply find the cosine of the angle and then the sine of the angle and you'll have the coordinate that you're looking for. So the book describes it this way. Every point on the unit circle is of the form cosine theta comma sine theta and those coordinates are the image of the point one zero because we always start at the point one zero. Then we rotate it a certain amount which we call magnitude theta and we rotate it about the origin. So let's go ahead and put some of the what I call compass points onto our unit circle. Students should have gotten a unit circle in class last time and in class last time we did the degrees on the inside, the revolutions on the second circle out, radians on the third circle out, and today we're going to start doing some elements in the fourth circle out, which I call the compass points. Think about being at the north, south, east, or westernmost points on this circle. That would give us this coordinate here. So let's start with the easternmost point on the circle, would be at the point 1 comma 0. That's the location of this coordinate on the circle itself. Remember that the circle has a radius of 1. If I rotate 90 degrees, I would end up up here, and that coordinate is located at 0, 1. Again, because the radius of the circle is consistently a 1. As students go around, they could also include here which quadrant they're in and the characteristics of all the coordinates in that quadrant. Keep in mind that it's cosine for x and sine for y. We'll revisit this in just a moment. In quadrant two, remember that the x values are negative, the y values are positive. If we rotate down to 180 degrees, the coordinate there is at the point negative one, zero. Down here in quadrants three and four, quadrant three, everything's negative. At the point 270, we're at the coordinate zero, negative one. And in quadrant four, all the x's are positive, all the y's will be negative. So now we've got some compass points that we can utilize. So let's go back to the notes now and utilize this whole idea of a rotation. Sometimes the questions in the book will be using this capital R and they'll say, you know, rotate 90 degrees. So then you would simply take the original coordinate at one comma zero and you'd rotate it 90 degrees. Then you would give the new coordinate of zero, one. Or they might say rotate 270 degrees. So then you'd give the coordinate of where you are now down at six o'clock or the southernmost point and you'd have the coordinate zero negative one. Going a little bit further now we might ask you a question with just the cosine or the sine. So for example if I asked you the cosine of 90 degrees what you would do is rotate 90 degrees so that you're in this position and then you would give the x value at that location. The x value there would be the zero so now we know that the cosine of 90 is 0. What about the sine at 180? If you travel to 180 on the unit circle and give the y value there, we know that that value is also 0. How about the sine at 270? 270 is down here and the sine value there again is the y value, so we would say negative 1. So those are some of the values that students can be starting to practice to get themselves ready for their unit circle quiz. So they should be able to say what the cosine of 90 is or the sine of 360 and so on. In general, another value that students should be able to do is something like the sine of 450. This would not be on the oral unit circle quiz, but it could be on the written unit circle quiz that we'll be having. The sine of 450 just means that we've gone around the circle more than one time. We just need to know how much further around the circle we've gone past that one rotation. So I would just take away the 360, which gets rid of that one first rotation, and that gets me to 90 degrees. So then I know that the sine of 450 and the sine of 90 would end up being at the same location. Sine, remember, is the y value, so I'd give the y value at this location here which would again be the point one. We also need to talk about the tangent function today. And I apologize, there's a piece missing here. Let's write that in more clearly. The tangent is always found by doing the sine over the cosine. It is optional to also do the opposite over the adjacent if you're working with a right triangle, but on the unit circle we oftentimes use sine over cosine. Students need to memorize this. So say to yourself a few times, tangent is the sine over the cosine. 
If we're doing the tangent of negative 270, one of the ways that I handle negatives is I imagine the positive version of it instead. So if I start here at our starting point at 3 o'clock, I travel 270 degrees around, I've traveled 3 quarters of the way around. Now let's do that going the other way because that's what it means to travel negatively. So if I travel 3 quarters of the way around going the other direction, I'm going to end up at 90. So finding the tan of negative 270 would be the same as me finding the tan of positive 90. To do the tan, I would simply do the sine of 90 divided by the cosine of 90. Now I know the sine of 90 is 1 and the cosine of 90 is 0. When you divide by 0, you get an undefined answer or an error message on your calculator. So I'm going to say that the tan of negative 270 is undefined. Know that the tangent is the only one of the three trig functions that could have that as its possible answer. Not all tangents will be undefined, but some of them will, because on occasion you will be dividing by zero. We're going to do a word problem next. This is example three from page 231 in the textbook. We've got a starfish that's been subscribed onto the vertices of a pentagon and also onto the unit circle. It's inscribed is the word I'm looking for. Inscribed onto a unit circle. One of the points of the arms of the starfish is at the point one zero. If each one of these is at a regular pentagon coordinate, regular means all the same angles, all the same sides. That's a idea of back from geometry class. So if we know that all these angles and all these sides are the same, we can figure out what rotation we need to get from one point to the next. So I'm going to do this in both degrees and radians. If the 360 is being divided up into a chunk of 5, I would simply divide by 5. Or in radians, I would just take the 2 pi, which is the distance around, and divide that into 5s as well. So in degrees, I would get 72 degrees, or in radians, I'd have 2 pi over 5. To get where coordinate B is going to be located, remember that the coordinate 1, 0 is being rotated this amount. So to find where that new coordinate would be, I would simply type in the cosine of 72 degrees and the sine of 72 degrees. At this point, I would like students to grab their calculator. Let's go ahead and type that in. On the black calculator, you would hit the trig button. On the gray calculator, you should have a cosine button available. So hit trig, hit cosine, and I'm going to do cosine of 72, and I'm going to do a control enter to get a decimal answer. Now when I get my answer here, I get a negative 0.967. They want us to round to the thousandth. And I'm going to take a look and say, you know what, that number doesn't make sense. If I'm going to point B, I'm in quadrant 1, so I have to have all positive results. So there's something wrong with the answer that I got here. So let's go back to our calculator and take another look. I want this to be 72 degrees, and it is possible that my calculator thinks that I'm in some other mode other than degree mode. So if I can, I want to try to tell it, hey, this is a 72 degree measure. There are some ways for students to find that degree symbol. So let's go back and highlight that, hit enter to re-paste it or recopy it. And I'm going to move my cursor back, and there's two places, three places you can find the degree symbol. You can do control and then the little book button looks like an open book, and degree symbol is there, so we can just select that. You can also get it by hitting the exclamation point menu, and on some calculators you can get it in the pi menu as well. So there's some other options there for you, but I know that the book function works on all the calculators. Now if I hit control enter, I'm going to get the right answer because now the calculator knows that that 72 is an actual degree value, not a radian value. So I'm going to go back and write that one down, 0 0.309. So 0.309 is the one I'm looking for, not that one. So I just want to show kids how to make sure that their document is in the right mode. I would encourage kids not to use the scratch pad in chapter 4. The scratch pad tends to be finicky when it comes to putting things in the correct mode. So to get your calculator in the right mode, you can either, again, use your degree symbol itself, or just go to the document button. The gray calculators don't have a document button, so you would just do control and then the home screen. If you do have a document button, just go to the settings, settings again, and choose general. 
The second one down needs to be in degrees. So just arrow down to that one, choose degree, hit OK. And then I would recommend that you save this document so that you know that it's in degree mode. So go back to document and choose file save and just call it a degree document. That way you can always go back to that and know that it's in degree mode. We also need to do the sign. So since that degree symbol is kind of hard to navigate through, I'm just going to copy that and I'm going to change that to sign. So I hit trig, choose sign, and it didn't cooperate, so I'm going to have to try that again. 72 degrees. Let's get rid of the extra piece that didn't work like I wanted it to. And now we'll hit control enter to get the decimal equivalent. 0.951 is what I'm looking for. And let's see if that answer makes sense in terms of the context of the question. I know I'm in quadrant one. I'm about a third of the way horizontally to get to this point. So I got my 0.3 and I'm almost all the way up to the top of the circle vertically. So that answer makes sense. If I needed to find point C, all I would do is take what I did in B and double it because I know that I'm doing two 72 degree angles to get there. So I would do cosine of 72 times two and the same thing with the sine. If I was trying to find point D, I would do the same thing, but now I just multiply by three. For E, I would just multiply by four and you'd end up with equivalent formulas there. We're done officially with the notes for this lesson, but I do want students to look at one more item, and that is example four, a Ferris wheel question. Cam comes from page 232 in the textbook, and it refers to a Ferris wheel that is 212 feet tall with 44 seats. They ask the question, how high is each seat off of the ground as you travel around the wheel? The book does their explanation, which you can read on your own. I want to just talk through a little bit of a summary of how you would figure out this question. First of all, it is important for students to note that when we figure this out, we are making an assumption that this wheel is sitting on the ground. Obviously, if that were true in real life, it would be quite painful. As you travel around the Ferris wheel, when you hit this bottom por portion, either you'd be scraping on the ground or your legs would get cut off. So obviously, we're assuming that that piece has been eliminated. We know that the height of the Ferris wheel is 212. So if we're looking at the radius of the circle, we know that that's going to be a 106. We're going to start at 3 o'clock, just like we normally do on a unit circle and we would know that there's 44 seats moving around. So similar to what we did with the Pentagon problem just now, to figure out how many angles or how big each angle is, we would just take the whole circle and divide by however many divisions we have. So we divided by five, here we would divide by 44. So you can see here they have each of their angles divided by 44. They did it in radians, you could also do it in degrees. So you just change that to 360 if that were the case. So they did 2 pi divided by 44 to get their angle measure. Remember that when you're doing the angle measure, it should be in radians whenever you're using this arc length measurement, which we learned in lesson 4.1, the angle measure needs to be in radians. The radius is 106, and we're going to use the sine of the angle because we are only interested in the y or the vertical component. Since this seat is already up halfway, we have the 106 for the radius, and then the rest of that is r times theta. So the radius is 106, and then the angle measure is 2 pi over 44, and so that's where they get these calculations from. So you're 106 up off the ground automatically, and then we do 106 times the seat number. And they just do that each time as you maneuver to the next seat. You just double or triple or quadruple and so on. So now you can see what each of the different feet are for each of the different seats. If students come across a Ferris wheel question, I'm hoping they could easily change the radius length and change the number of seats and figure out what seat they need and do their calculations.